Allen from TommyAllenMusic.com. This week, I got the pleasure of speaking with Marcus Malone, an old friend of mine from 1997, when we got together and worked on his album one more time. Let's get to it. Well, thank you, Marcus. Well, thank you, Tommy. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, it's been a long time. We was gonna, I was hoping to see you at uh, Cumbria. We was gonna be doing that gig together at the Bowness Festival. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you were on that. I saw that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was down to you. You was the first person that got me um, out gigging. You, yeah. At the jam night. I don't know if you remember. At, yeah, I do. I sure do. Barnum. And then I found this. You walked, you walked in with that little. I found this little. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> which goes back to September 11th, 97. Wow. So, and on here we've got Heart for Rent, One More Time, Acoustic, Pride and Joy, Ain't That Loving You, Yesterday Man, Show Me the Money, Life Sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then I've got the CD, but I've, I've got a one that's pre this which, oh, the, the, what a horrible cover. Yeah, with the man, the, that robot oh. man. <laughs> you know, my brother, I went to see him in Detroit. He uses it as a, um, <laughs> a for, for his coffee cup. <laughs> the man smiled me said, yeah, that's good for this, man. <laughs> Thank you, you know, for giving me that opportunity back then. Yeah, you know, great. And, we ended up playing we played a lot of gigs, man. Yeah. All of the gigs. Yeah. That was, well, that was my first band, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah well, I've been researching yeah, you yeah. today. And yeah, it seems the first one was that one more time in 2001. Um, yeah. And then before that, it, which I wanted to get into was your earlier days, was the Marcus release in 1976. Yeah. So, yeah. so if we jump back, where was your first musical sort of upbringing? First musical upbringing. Well, I'm from Detroit. Yeah, you know that. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. But was your mum dad musical? Uh we went to. Well, as far as musical, their musicality came from church, I suppose. That would probably be my first experience with it, and uh, singing in the choir. Right. And uh, I started singing when I was about what five, six, singing with the uh, um, the minister or the leader of the choir. Right. And uh, I had voice lessons with him, and it was almost a forced thing, really, because I was scared shitless. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you stand in front of me, will sing when I sing. You know, because you don't. Uh, yeah, I remember the story. I still remember the first time I opened my mouth. Listen to the voice of the Savior. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and everybody's kind of they kind of cheer you on, and it got steadier and steadier, and you know. And then after that, after that little experience, and it was great. Did, but, did you know it from a young age you'd want to follow music your whole life? Well, yeah, I did actually. Yeah, I always loved. Yeah, I loved music. Yeah, and uh, I, I loved to listen to records. Uh, well, obviously in Detroit, you buy. Didn't they didn't have? We couldn't afford albums at that time. We used to buy singles. Uh, maybe it's the same thing they do. Well, they don't buy records at all now, do they? No, <laughs> it's no. all download. But uh, at the time, it was all physical. Yeah, you buy every week. Uh, Motown would release a new record every week. Right. Basically, the uh, you know, Mary Wells, great, you know. But uh, yeah, I was new, and I used to sing the melodies over and over and try to make up my own little things, you know. And uh, yeah, it was great. Oh, cool. And then when. What sort of age was you when you got Ike Turner's management interested? Wow, well, we were just leaving high school. Uh, that was about eight, 18, 19. And, yeah. And was it that age you then travelled to L.A.? Or yeah, they flew us out to L.A. Well, no, we, I drove because I was in a hurry. I drove out to L.A. Right. And uh, I, I wanted to get the hell out of Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> get me out of here. <laughs> so, <laughs> three or four days driving out to L.A. <laughs> So what what led them to find you? Was it was it a gig or? Uh, we had management in uh, in Detroit. Uh, a guy named uh, Italian guy named Joe Pereno, and uh, he was managing us. And uh, he sent them. He had done a, a demo on us, and uh, he sent it out to all the companies in LA. But uh, it somehow landed in. Uh, Ike Turner's hands and his management, uh, Dennis Rubenstein, 
it somehow landed in their hands and uh, they played it for their record company, which was United Artists at the time. And uh, back, well, back then, if you were live, if you were good live, uh, well, also we were, well, let's face it, we were young <laughs> and pretty and all that stuff. So we ticked all the boxes. So they, uh, they, flew, out, they flew out to us in Detroit. Right. They sent a team, checked us out one night, and yeah, we won it. Oh, that's cool. Away we go. And, it, <laughs> and it's a more of a rock album. It is. It's definitely metal, yeah. Right, okay. So Because I got turned on to, uh, well, in Detroit, what you do, you get, at the time, is uh, all the rock houses were open, and R&B, but uh, I got turned on to, like, Iggy and the Stooges and MC5 and all that stuff when I was young, and I was kind of hanging out in Ann Arbor, and uh, I just kind of fell into that and, you know, put my first band together, and it just happened to be rock when we were really young. And then I met all these guys from Toledo, and they were in the same thing. Well, actually, they were more into. Uh, we started. I started doing clubs, is what it was. Like they were doing like Chicago and yeah, yeah. Uh, all the uh, more kind of not R and B, but more pop. I guess that would be called pop back then, but kind of definitely R and B. And Joe Walsh, all those guys that lived in. Well, they were sort of not Chicago, but. They were from that era, that Midwest sort of thing, because Joe Walsh was sort of, I thought he was from Detroit. I'm not sure where he's from, but he's from somewhere around there, because I knew him before. I didn't know him, but I knew of him. He was one of the big idols there. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, it was just great. Well, it seemed a lot of rock around there. There was a, there was a, there was a band called Death in 1971. I don't know if you knew them. No, nah, Detroit, know. and then the other one that you mentioned, MC Five. Oh yeah, I know them. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Well, they yeah they went to that was they were Ann Arbor was the big scene there in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So you had the MC Five, Iggy Pop, SRC, yeah. Bob Seger, Ted Nugent, <laughs> yeah. and uh, uh, back then uh, in Detroit, everybody, all the bands, not like here, but the bands banded together and booked themselves as a unit. You know, so you you go see. NC5 and Iggy Pop would open and, and maybe uh, SRC, that was like a team of guys, you know, they would all play the gigs together in the college circuit. Right. And uh, you would always end up seeing three or four bands together and then it, there was uh, 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 down by in Detroit itself, the uh, Grandy Ballroom was a big thing. Okay. Okay. And um, we used to go there every week and see all the bands, English bands. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they all toured. Where I saw the got turned on the Led Zeppelin and the Who. I saw all those guys there. Well, I saw um, doing some more research around the sort of late seventies. Elvis performed there in seventy five. It was wow. and it was his biggest audience of his career. It said oh, at, really? at the uh, Pontiac Silver Dome. Oh, Pontiac! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, <laughs> and then the other thing I found, which was quite interesting, was the 1967 Detroit riots. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so how was, how, do you remember that? Oh, yeah, of course. I sat on my <laughs> sat on my front porch and watched Detroit burn. <laughs> People running down the street with, uh, you know, dishwashers, <laughs> and refrigerators. And, <laughs> and I'm like, Mom, can I go get, no. <laughs> Put your ass down. <laughs> well, it said yeah, that went on for two days. Oh, oh yeah, it was, it was longer than that, but it, it it completely changed everything, including music, of course, because right. uh, before that, you had, well, pretty much Detroit was pretty much, well, black music. Like, I lived down the street from a place called the 20 Grand Ballroom. Right. It was uh, part of the Chitlin circuit, which I actually played there when I was about 13, 14. And B.B. Um, um, King, you know, he passed by there on your way to school. It'd be B.B. King, uh, Bobby Blue Bland, uh, whoever. Every week there'd be a different, you know, artist as part of the Chitlin circuit with Detroit. You know, white people didn't tend to play there. And black people tended to stay in that area. They didn't go to the suburbs. But after the riots, that's, everything kind of changed. It opened up. Uh, that's when you had that mixed thing. After that, that's I think that's when I 
discovered the uh, MC5 and all that stuff because I started going to Ann Arbor and, you know. Right, okay. And all the white bands started coming closer because <laughs> 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 they had the Grandy Ballroom to go to. So that was right. That was right in Detroit, really. <laughs> so from L.A., what happened in the years that followed after the, the Marcus album? Because obviously the next the next thing was 2001, which is 25 years. Yeah, yeah. I had management, I think. I lived off of management. We had, uh, there was a band called, I was in a band called Zhvugi, which was, uh, they were trying to do a black rock and roll thing, black rock thing. And there was uh, some people that got, and they found me, and they put us together with four other black guys. Uh, Steve Ross, who I still, I'm still in touch with a lot of them on Facebook. And, uh, yeah, they had a lot of money and they kind of, yeah. Any yeah, albums during that time? Not released, no. Right. We did some records, but none, none of them released, no. And then but, what, uh, what led you to the UK then? Oh, I'm sure you, I thought you'd do that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so I came a- here with a woman. Oh, oh she gave me the blues. Uh, that's when I discovered the blues. <laughs> <laughs> I came here. I got married to a girl in L.A. Okay. And uh, she wanted to come over here. And I said, well, yeah, okay. So I was just kind of not really. I mean, I was doing music. But in L.A., you don't really. It's more of a showcase town, really. Unless you were actually signed and, uh, you know, to a label. And you're actually working out of L.A. But in L.A., uh, the circuit, the, what I was doing is, you know, you had management or you didn't have, which, well, I, I think by then I had lost management. So, yeah, so I just made the move with her. I said, well, I'll just try some things over here. And I knew some people over here. I knew uh, Jeff Hanlon. Uh, he he was a <laughs> manager of, I shouldn't mention his name, but Gary Glitter. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> well, I knew him, so he gave me work. With, I sang DVs for Gary Glitter for a couple, right. couple of years. And uh, he put some money behind me to uh, do one more time. Right, okay. <laughs> and uh, some other songs, which he never really released. So then later I redid them uh, with you <laughs> <laughs> and uh, actually put them out. Yeah, well, there were so. songs before I remember learning that was pre me knowing you. It was like Drowning Man. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which is a great song. Oh, that was with Jimmy Barnes. Yeah, Jimmy Barnes. But that yeah. was recorded here in the UK, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, yes. It was, yes. That was recorded by... Uh, you didn't play on that, no. But it was recorded at the same, similar time, I believe. Right, okay. I can't remember. You came over and you did pretty much solo stuff, didn't you? I, I'd rec- I recorded the basic tracks already, hadn't it? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um... Yeah, solos and some rhythm. I think like on Baller Chain and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Was the whole song. Most of it had been, re- the drums and bass must have been recorded already. Too far, I can't that. remember. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember the amp was in your loft. Yeah. Oh, that was good. And then downstairs you had that desk like in the hallway right where the door was. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, that was that. Like, yeah. And in oh, the kitchen right I behind. Got... Yeah. <laughs> well, now it's, now it's even worse. I'm in a closet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still going backwards, but I'm making good records. <laughs> it's the sound, they sound great. I think they do. They still home sing. recordings? or hmm? They still like do the drums and that in the studio and then do the yeah, guitars? Yeah, the drum bass in the studio. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, usually, uh, last one was done in Bath because that's where Ennis lives. Uh, nice studio, actually, Nam Studios, and uh, we did drums and bass there. Uh, but yeah, all my albums are the drums and bass. That it has to be live for me. So, but you do the vocals do at home, don't you? Yeah, I do the vocals here. Yeah. yeah. What we've got here then, as I said, then what followed? You had Walking Shoes in two thousand and two. Uh, Blue Radio album. Then Hurricane in 2007, Let the Sun Shine In 2011, Stand or Call, Fall, sorry, 2014, mm. 2017, A Better Man, and then the most recent one on January this year, Come Together with Sibin and yourself. 
yeah, yeah. So that's the one you're promoting now. Yeah, if you want to call it. <laughs> well, the best you can, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think we're, by the time we get out again, we're going to have to do a re-release. Mm. Uh, I was talking to uh, oh, Pete Feenster about it. or got to find a way of kind of rebooting it again because we spent all the money to do it, have, for it to be released in January. We had all the gigs lined up, and then, boom, this happened. And I was like, yeah. Well, but- it kind of went dead. It's, it's like, <laughs> what did we spend all that money for? <laughs> I know. But you weren't and, to know uh, in January, I suppose. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. How are we to know them yet? We couldn't have predicted this in a million years. No. But, uh, so so when we come out of this, this will be the thing that you'll be pushing next? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah of course. We've got to try and get a, like I say, reboot it with, you know, uh, a gig somewhere and everybody come to, come out again. But people that are listening, when I put this out, they can get it from MarcusMalone.com. That's for sure. Yep. No, 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 no. MaloneSybin.com. Oh, there's a different website, is there? Yeah, I got two websites. One, you know, he has his own, I have my own. But uh, the one we sell the records on, uh, which uh, we sell all our merchandise on MaloneSybin.com. Okay. And uh, it's through uh, Music Glue. So okay. it's pretty easy to do. And is that your, your stuff before as well? The albums. Uh, yeah, you all. There's a link on there as well. All my other stuff is on Music Glue as well under Marcus Malone. Right. Okay. And, yeah. and that's still Redline Records. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Still the same. Yeah. No, okay. Uh, what other questions are I going to say here? I was I was looking through some of the song titles on that first album. Where did High School <laughs> Ladies and Street Corner <laughs> Babies come from? <laughs> <laughs> well, we were in high school. What do you think? <laughs> do you remember the words to that still? High school ladies, <laughs> Jacona <Jacobna> babies. <laughs> oh man, that's great. Yeah, yeah. that's what we're into then. <laughs> and uh, what, what was the other one? Uh, something about ball. A salmon ball, yeah. <laughs> Come to the salmon ball. I want to ball you up. <laughs> well, there's pillow stars. Yeah, yeah. pillow stars. Yeah. Dream Will. Yeah. Uh, Black Magic. Mm. Kelly. Gypsy Fever. And Rive Unto the Falcon. Rise Unto the Falcon. The words to that were actually written by the roadie. One of our... <laughs> right. Have anything to do with it, really? <laughs> <laughs> we it was very prog rock. <laughs> the album is, is part. I would call that a, a metal prog rock kind of. You know, a lot of yes influences and tr- two triple guitar harmonies. And have you heard it? Yeah, I heard it back with yeah, you. Yeah. yeah, some double guitar harmonies, triple guitar harmonies on Dream World. There's three right. triple guitar harmonies, <laughs> and it has been uh, re-released, isn't it? Yeah. On uh, Zoom Records? Oh, no, lately it's on Candy. Yeah, Rock Candy Records. Rock Candy Records, yeah, it's been re-released, yeah. Yeah, it's one of those things that's always coming out again. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> well, jumping into your, um, your, your writing and stuff, what, what is your method for songwriting? My method? Mm. Well, you know, that I just kind of, usually I just write off of, uh, if I hear something I like, uh, I just usually get an idea. And it just comes to me. Do you write an acoustic or electric or? Uh, I don't really have any particular pattern. Right. Um, it's just whatever I have at the time. I usually, if I'm writing, by, if I'm by myself, I usually start with a drum beat. Sometimes, or if I have a melody in my head, I'll start with that. And there's sometimes words comes first. Sometimes music. Sometimes a drum beat. I mean, there's really no, you know. It just happens. Yeah, yeah, I'm just driving down the street and I'll say, ooh, look at that. <laughs> double D, double D. Double D. Double D. <laughs> and the other one that came out like when I was driving down the street from on my way from the gym, yeah. And uh, <laughs> I saw this girl. I went, damn, how'd she get all that into that? <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite song you've written? Ooh, favorite song. Hmm. Hmm. That's a good question. Never thought of it. Um. Probably, probably the latest songs. Um. Uh, probably uh, "Better Man." I love "Better Man." Um. 
And the new album, yeah, I'd say Better Man is probably one of my favorites. Okay. Or Stand or Fall, which are on the Stand or Fall album, the title song for that. Yeah, those are probably two of my favorites. I love those. Right. And what would be your Desert Island Disc? My what? Desert Island Disc. If you could take oh, one. Desert Island Disc. If I could take one record with it. Yes. Hmm. Uh, I've got a record on the tip of my tongue and I can't remember the name. (laughs) I hate that. Uh, Oh, God. Mm. Let me look it up. Really? Have we got time? Yes! I always play this album first thing in the morning. Really? Here we go. My favorite album is... Of course there's Hendrix, but... Uh, Lewis Taylor. I thought it was a long time ago. I love Lewis Taylor. (laughs) Lewis Taylor. Yeah. Odd one, but I do. And after that, it'll be a Hendrix album. Probably Electric Ladyland. Oh, okay. Okay. And what books are you reading at the moment? Books am I reading? What book is that? Ah, Never Fade. Never Fade? Not, not, yeah. That's a, it's a trilogy of some sort. I just started it last night. It's from the Darkest Mind series. Okay. Uh, but uh, and I just read. I like the kind of vampire-y kind of things. You know? okay. <laughs> yeah, and me, I, what TV stuff are you watching at the moment? Yeah, I watch. Well, well, I can watch in here. I watch Westworld. I love Westworld. Okay. And, 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 yeah, that's great. Great story. What hobbies do you have other than music? My hobbies, other than music, I normally, yeah, well, I can't do them, can I? I just started running. Okay. And, uh, I remember you used to do that a lot before, didn't you, gym? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'd, I'd go to the gym and I'd swim. I, my biggest thing is swimming, which they closed the pools down, so right. it kind of killed me off there. So my wife just ordered a, uh, oh, you know, Claudia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, yeah, she ordered a uh, a bike, uh, whatever elliptical bike. Okay. So it's out in the hall, and I've got to put it together. So I, <laughs> I guess I'll be doing that later tonight. Uh, but yeah, I'll say my hobbies are pretty much exercise. I read at night. I always read for about an hour before I go to sleep. And uh, uh, other than that, yeah, I just yeah. I'm, like everybody else on the computer, <laughs> glued in to something or other. How is Claudia? Uh, oh, she's all right. You know, she's yeah. she works for Facebook, so oh, okay. she's business is good over there. <laughs> People are still streaming and whatever. It's all the same. And back when I was working with you, you had the little uh, Jasmine just been born. Jasmine, oh, I know. Uh, I've seen on Facebook. She's not not tiny anymore. <laughs> No. <laughs> 20, I think she's 21, 21 in June. Yeah. Is she music at all? No, nah, she does photography. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, she had an exhibition already. She had one exhibition, which went well. And um, yeah, that's what she does. And, uh, the little one, no, well, she's not so little anymore. She's 14. Right. And uh, she is... Uh, they both went to Brit school. Okay. No. Uh, well, it just got into Brit school, so she's doing music, voice. So. Oh, good. Letting her do her thing. I just I helped her set up a little studio in her room, so uh, she wants to work on her own. <laughs> so I said, oh, fine. If you need me, call me. But bye. <laughs> so. 
If you could change anything in the music industry, what would it be? What would it be? Uh, way. I mean, if music could be, well, obviously, I, well, I guess I'd go back to somehow become more physical. Right. Uh, you know. Not digital, you mean? Yeah, less digital and more uh, physical. I mean, well, but I mean, it's it's not going to happen because younger people are brought up in a digital world. So yeah. they want it now. They want it fast. They want to hit the button and get it. And they don't. But a lot, I see a lot of the young bands now are coming out with LPs or EPs or mm. actual physical vinyl. And uh, to have something in your hands that you can see with a picture on it. Mm. And I think some of the young people are now getting into that. Uh, as a matter of fact, they said, I think last year, the year before, it was the first time that vinyl outsold, you know. Yeah, it's picking up. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd like to see that promoted more. Uh, and somehow see, well, if, when you make music, it'd be nice if, if there's more accountability for it and people could actually get paid for what, they, what they're what they doing. I mean, they do, but a lot of it goes under the woodwork because of the digital world. What was the biggest hurdle you've had to get over in your career? My career? Mm. Mm. <laughs> uh, well... My biggest hurdle, as far as uh, well, right now, I don't know. I don't, it's almost personal. <laughs> Getting over myself. <laughs> well, I just wonder if there's any walls you hit, you know, along your path. Where along my path? Yeah. Well, for me, yeah. Uh, I, I would suppose when I was younger. Well, actually, I had, I was very lucky when I was younger. I was black, but I managed to get into. Uh, well, the white world, I suppose, which was clearly I wasn't supposed to be there, but I did. But once that fell, I fell off that, shall we say, boat and <laughs> back to earth. It was very difficult for me. I couldn't. There was definitely a wall there because being black, they expect you to do specifically R and B. You're categorized that way automatically, and I was doing rock, <laughs> so. Uh, Back at that time, you did, they didn't know, well, what do we do with it? <laughs> you know, or even though I had already had product out, they still were going, oh, what do we do with it? Because uh, if you listen to my records now, they're still, you know, it's just the way I write. I write a mixture of stuff. Some of it's very R&B and some of it's very heavy. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that's just the way it is. Yeah. Well, that's obviously part of my influence, being young and being in your band first. Yeah. Was that mix of mm -hmm. styles mm -hmm. it wasn't all blues that i listened to before i met you and then suddenly yeah. you put more rock and more twists on things and <laughs> but you know it's yeah it's a i think it's a good thing well yeah so do i but i mean yeah but it is when you when record companies look at it they want to put you in a box, box. Mm. and uh if you don't fit in that box and they move to the next <laughs> so uh, yeah, yeah. So that was that was definitely my biggest hurdle because I mean in LA where we talked about that earlier because we had that all black band and uh, I mean I had a chance to, uh, we had a chance to go quite big then we had several labels but they chose another band that they identified with more that they put in a box and he became very famous actually <laughs> so and uh, here I'm <laughs> so yeah what's the best advice you've been given best advice I've been given um, hmm, hmm, who's giving me advice not too many people they usually let me go <laughs> <laughs> oh it's Marcus Unless it, <laughs> what about your mum huh? what about your mother uh, my mother uh, does she have any words of wisdom that yeah. said you her, her words were you know stick to it you can do it believe in yourself yeah I mean she believes that, you know, I believe in you and you can do anything you want. Yeah. You just keep going and try. Don't, don't listen to people. Just do what you believe. Yeah. And you can do it. <laughs> and I firmly believe that. And what advice would you give someone yourself starting out in the music industry? Uh, starting off in the music industry, uh, uh, 
listen, learn as much as you can, uh, and the same advice. If if you find something you believe in, you know, focus on that and and do that, and don't let people put you off that off your path, even if it's different. Especially if it's different, people will try to put you off that path. <laughs> so, you know, you have to believe. Uh, just a quick fire. I do these with everyone now, just so what comes out first. Quick answers. So, cash your card. Cash. <laughs> <laughs> Love or money. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Morning or night. Morning, definitely for me. Tea or coffee. Tea. Paul Rogers or Steven Tyler? Paul Rogers. Blues or rock? Oh, that's a hard one. Oh, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Uh, oh, Ugh. rock. Rock. Electric or acoustic? Mm, that's another hard one. Uh, geez. Uh, electric. And do you believe in ghosts? Yes or no? Yes. You do. Okay. <laughs> That's a quick answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Marcus. Thank you so okay. much for your time, man. Um, oh, thank you, Tommy. <laughs> and thank you for you know the opportunity back in '97. Yeah. And um, I hope we meet yeah. up when all this yeah. is over. Oh, great, great, great plan. Uh, great. Plan. Still you. are a great player. <laughs> Haven't heard you lately, though. <laughs> Looking forward to that uh, uh, gig that we were going to do together. In yeah, the third. yeah, me too. I really was because I hadn't yeah. seen you for a long time. I've yeah. only messaged you a couple of times on Facebook, but yeah, you know, it, it'd have been nice just to you know shake your hand, buy your drink, say hello. Well, look after yourself. I certainly will. And talking to you, man. Good thumbs up, man. Okay. All right. <laughs> Cheers, Marcus. Thank you All for right. your time. All right. Bye bye. Cheers. Okay. And that was Marcus Malone. Hey, it's Tommy Allen from TommyAllenMusic.com and that was Marcus Malone speaking with me. I hope you enjoyed it. You can find out more about Marcus at www.marcusmalone.com Next week, we have Ian Parker, the great guitar player based in the Midlands around Birmingham Way. We start talking about his music and what he's been up to. Please hit the subscribe button, give us a like. Until next week, stay safe. We're from our director.